Um, the next paper is Algorithmic Probability Heuristic Programming in AGI by Ray Solomonoff. It will be read by Marcus Hutter. No, it's me, I cut my paper, though. So. <laughs> um, yeah, so I will give the talk for Ray. And um, it's not exactly about the paper, although I mentioned the new contributions in the paper too, but it's more about Solomonov's legacy and um, his main contributions um, to, to this field, or one of the main contributions. Okay, um, so let me um, go immediately to the first slide. So induction is key for AGI. You have heard that several times, so I can be quick about that. Um, so here's a definition of induction. So induction infers general models from specific observations or specific facts or data, which usually exhibit some regularities or properties or relations. Okay. And why is induction relevant for AGI? Um, I guess most of you have been in my tutorial, so I will be very fast on that too. Um, we want to induce or learn models because we use these models for prediction, and these predictions are then used to make decisions, and decisions lead to some actions. And you know, in the agent framework, you want the agents to act somehow. Okay. So here's an example. Um, so induction, for instance, is finding a model of the world economy. Then you use this model for predicting the future stock market. Then you make a decision whether you want to invest in assets. Um, in, in, in which assets in stocks or in bonds, yeah? And then if you, you know, do that and you trade large quantities, you may even influence the market and that's your action and you get some feedback. So if you have a small quantity, small trade, then this last line doesn't matter. And um, Ray for a long time only considered sort of um, up, to, up to this decision part. Okay, so... Um, Here's some examples of inductive reasoning. Sometimes inductive reasoning is regarded more general, so it could be prediction and inductive inference, and inductive inference is um, defined more narrowly, but that's sort of, you know, different people use this term differently. Um, so sequence prediction belongs for some to the category of inductive reasoning. For instance, yeah, I mentioned already stock market prediction, or it could be IQ tests like 1, 4, 9, 16. What comes next? Or a classification, classification task. Um, like predicting you know, whether an email is spam is actually also a prediction task. So what you have is you have some sort of feature vector, some class label, feature vector, class label, and then another feature vector, and then you want to ask what is the next class label. So classification is nothing else than a sequence prediction task, or you can phrase it as a sequence prediction task. Um, hypothesis testing or identification, yeah, it's about induction. And um, so the problem is that of course, for many situations, we have specific methods or algorithms or statistics to do that. But for AGI, we need one algorithm who can cover with all induction problems, at the very least, all induction problems where humans are good at. Yeah, and that's quite a large class. Okay, so we want a single, formal, general, complete theory for prediction. And that was what Solomonov's goals was and what he achieved. Okay. Um, so, um, these are the philosophical ingredients. Um, Occam's razor, we all know that. If you have two theories which are equally good, take the simpler one. Then there's Epicurus who says quite the opposite. If you have two theories um, or more you should, which are consistent with the data, you should keep them all. And the compromise is to have a higher weight towards simpler theories. Um, then there's Bayes' rule for updating beliefs. If you have a prior belief and you have new observations, um, you can compute with Bayes' rules your posterior belief. But Bayes doesn't tell you how to start with beliefs. For this, you need namely Occam's razor. And Occam's razor is qualitative. In order to quantify simplicity, you need Kolmogorov complexity, um, which is rooted in the concept of universal Turing machines, because they can be used for coding. Okay. And um, Ray Solomonov, in the 60s, or actually started already end of the 50s, combined all these principles and techniques into one formal system of inductive inference. So, I mean, in my tutorial, I gave a much um, slower introduction to that. But let's proceed. Um, so here is this universal a priori probability. And there are at least three different definitions which turns out to be equivalent. I present two very closely related of them. So Solomon has defined the universal a priori probability distribution, M of x is the probability that the output of a universal monotone Turing machine U 
starts with string x when provided with fair coin flips on the input tape. Okay, that means you have a universal Turing machine, you have an input tape and an output tape. And rather than putting some specific program on the input tape, you put random noise on the input tape. This Turing machine, this universal Turing will do something. I mean, often it will just halt or does nothing or loop, but sometimes it will output something. And since you have uniform noise on the input tape, there will be a probability distribution on the output tape. And m of x is the probability that x is on the output tape. Or more precisely, that there's a string on the output tape that starts with x. Okay? At first, that doesn't sound very sort of interesting or potentially interesting, but this distribution has remarkable properties. So here is a more formal definition, um, which is more or less the same. So what you do is um, you take all programs P and look whether this program on a universal Turing machine produces x, followed by something. And if this program has a certain length, so a number of bits, yeah, then the rest doesn't matter anymore. So I mean, the input tape consists of all zeros and ones. So but you read only the first say, L bits. So the probability that these first L bits are just you know, p is 1 half to the power L of p, the length of p, because each bit of this L has to be right. Yeah? So this gives a probability distribu contribution of 2 to the minus L of p, but then there are, of course, many different programs, and you sum them all up. And that's the probability of m of x. Okay. Um, so what it does is, um, if there's a string which has a short description, yeah, then it assigns a high probability. And if there's no short description, theoretically, there could be many long descriptions. But you can actually show that um, if there are many long descriptions, then there's also short description. That's a very interesting theory. So if there's no short description, then um, this quantity will be small. So it's roughly speaking 2 to the minus the length of the shortest description. So you can truncate this sum actually and approximate it and just take the shortest description. But for mathematical reasons, I mean, you, you need it. Precisely like that. OK. So, and here's Solomonov's major result. And it took him 40 years, uh, sorry, 14 years um, to prove that, at least if you look at the publication dates of the paper. So 64, he um, defined his a priori probability. And he argued that it's a good thing. And in 78, um, he proved that it's indeed good for prediction. And consider um, a sequence here x1, x2, x3, and so on, which is sampled from some unknown distribution mu. And so that's the true sampling distribution. And we assume we don't know that. I mean, that's the learning case. So the probability, the true probability of the next bit being xt, having observed x1, x2, and so on, is just you know the conditional probability, which is defined as this ratio. OK. So now here's Solomonov's central result. So Lomond's central result essentially says that m is a good substitute of mu. So m converges to mu in the following sense. Okay. Um, so what we ideally would like to do, we would like to use mu for prediction. So what is the probability that the next bit is 0, given that we have observed this? But we don't know mu. So let's replace that by Solomonov's distribution and use m for prediction and compare this true distribution, predictive distribution, with this universal distribution. OK, take the square loss, but actually you can take any other loss. And take the expectation, so you multiply with the probability of the past and sum over it. So that's the expected square difference. And then you sum over all time instances. And what Ray has shown is that this quantity is bounded by a finite constant. And this constant is proportional to the complexity of this environment mu. And the important thing that's linear, not also sort of exponential or something, and no big constant here. And, and this constant, you can argue it doesn't matter. OK, so what can we infer from this theorem? Um, so we have here an infinite sum, an infinite sum of non-negative quantities, which is finite. So that means, of course, that this quantity has to tend to 0. Because there's the expectation, and um, this implies that this quantity converges to 0 with probability 1. Okay. And that means that m converges to mu. Okay. So that's here. And I mean, if this convergence were just asymptotic, I mean, asymptotically we're all dead, that would be a nice theoretical result. But actually, um, you can show 
or this result implies rapid convergence in the following sense. So let's look at the cases where m deviates from mu bar at least epsilon. Yeah. You would like to have a smaller epsilon, but it could be larger than epsilon. So how often can that happen? So if this bound, so, um, so the bound was ln2 times k of mu, actually there should be a one half. Yeah. So it can happen at most c divided by epsilon squared times. Because, I mean, you sum all these epsilons up and you exceed the bound. So the number of epsilon deviations can be at most this constant. And the description length of the environment is typically reasonable, so you get a reasonable constant. Yeah. Okay. Um, you can make no statement about where these errors occur. So they can occur, occur very early or very late, so Ackermann late or so. Um, and you can show that this result cannot be improved. Um, but usually that's fine. I mean, sort of, you care about the number of errors. And if they are later than earlier, that's, I mean, typically even better, yeah? or at least not worse. Except, I mean, you have a product which you want to sell at some point and you don't want to have any errors anymore. Okay, this result holds for any computable probability distribution mu. So that's the only requirement of mu. So no stationarity assumptions or godicity or anything. So it could be the digits of pi or then the stock market, some model of the stock market or whatever you like. So one question is how, how does that work? I mean, how could that work that m converges to any mu, whatever you choose from mu? And um, the reason is, I mean, if you know statistics enough and Bayesian statistics, I mean, you sample this data x from your mu. So that means your data x um, have some or inherit some properties of this mu. <coughs> and m sort of is smart enough to figure out these properties. Or more technically, you can represent m, that's the third representation which I didn't present, as a Bayesian mixture over all computable probability distribution, which is equivalent to the definition I gave you, or more formally, all semi distributions. And then we all know if we have um, a class of distributions, we take a Bayesian mixture over it, then usually using this Bayesian mixture for prediction um, converges rather rapidly to the true distribution. Okay. So, um, so M is the universal predictor Ray Solomonov um, searched for and found and, um, yeah. Um, so you have heard in this session a lot of universal search and um, Ray was also interested in universal search. Um, so, but I can skip the explanation here because I think we had it in every talk. So it's running all programs in parallel and looking for a program, you know, which answers um, your question. And that's Levin's result you have seen before. And um, Jürgen and his group um, were the first uh, um, to, to take this theoretical um, optimal search and do something practical with it by, you know, tweaking it and um, being very smart with, with the programming languages and so on. Okay. Um. okay, so that's what they did. And Ray was also in this adaptive, interested in these adaptive versions of Levin search. And in this paper, um, in AGI 2010, uh, he defined the notion of a guiding probability distribution, GPT. And um, he devised some training sequences um, of problems starting from simple problems to more complex problems. And then once the simple problems are solved, they use the side information for adapting this probability distribution, um, hopefully towards, um, um, so in a way that more probability mass is on um, the problems and solutions um, of the more complex problems which works, you know, if the simple problems and complex problems have something in common, or the simple, the solutions to the simple problems can be used as modules for the more complex problems. Okay. Um, so here's my conclusion slide. Um, the algorithmic probability M can serve as a gold standard for induction systems. I mean, you can show that it's theoretically optimal in a very quantitative sense, but practically it's incomputable. Um, Ray would even called it as a feature and on a bug, yeah. Um, I'm not sure about that, yeah. But in any case, um, I think that's not really a problem. Um, it's like, you know, 
optimal play in zero-sum games like chess, that's minimax to the end and that's optimal. And yes, okay, for any real game you cannot use it, but you start approximating that. And the same you have to do um, for this universal notion of search. Okay. So, so this Solomonov distribution is a principal solution to the induction problem, which then um, can be used you know, as a key ingredient for AGI systems, at least the theoretically well-founded AGI systems. Okay. Um, and, you know, okay, that's the paper at the conference. Thanks.